on participants. Hello, so I am Daniel Tostado. This is Jean Taquet, um, and we are happy to have a, um, a webinar today with you all to discuss immigration questions. Uh, we're going to give it a couple more minutes and let people start to roll in progressively. Um, while we're waiting for people to start slowly coming in person by person, I thought it'd be interesting to present myself and present Jean. Um, so, and then Chris is our wonderful host. He is our tech guy, so he's helping us manage the room. Um, and it'll be, hi Chris, and it'll be uh, Jean and myself that end up managing the discussion itself. Um, so with regards to, uh, I think I'm gonna get distracted, Chris, by the ding dong sound. Could you deactivate the sound for us? Uh, I can try. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, um, I'm gonna add, for for the time being, since we're not configured in um, a webinar mode, I mm -hmm. would ask people to deactivate their videos, please. Um, we'll we'll be able to see each other later on when um, when we get into the Q and A. Yeah. Um, so, with regards to a bit of an introduction, um, uh, Jean, I'll let you speak about yourself uh, with regards to your experience. Um, you have many years of helping people immigrate to France. Um, you have your, uh, your S I uh, L where you uh, help people, your introduction kit into France. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about that, Jean, about your experience? Sure. Uh, what I can say is that I'm French. Uh, I have a five-year law school from uh, Pompion Sorbonne. I served in the army as a jurist officer. And when I moved to the United States, I became an associate member, which means not a full member of the Dewa State Bar Association. And I have retained that status uh, up to today. Uh, now for the work that I'm doing currently, started at the American Church in 1994 by helping people, basically the Filipino community of our church to get papers and I have officially started uh, to be in business in helping and assisting foreigners in 1997. And thanks to uh, Daniel, we are together hosting the uh, immigration clinic at the American Church that is uh, host every other Wednesday and where we have people as part of the church's um, services uh, I also uh, publish a column that is now getting to be close to 20 years old, uh, 30 years old now. And uh, in a nutshell, that's what I do. And this is who I am. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so Jean, you've been on my radar for a couple of years. I would say since at least 2017, when I got involved with the uh, refugee outreach um, through the American church, knowing that you'd already been running an uh, immigration clinic out of the basement of the American church. Um, and so I've had the privilege of working alongside you um, in your immigration clinic for the past two years now. And I think it's been really wonderful for me uh, sharpening my tools in immigration, um, seeing how you take a, a case file in your hand. You know, uh, in terms of my experience, having done American law school, then French law school, then staying in France, doing an internship with a, a big French law firm, uh, Kara Wahid, and then continuing on with you, Jean, doing legal aid, um, let's call it immigration assistance um, on a volunteer basis while I was working at the OCD, and then pivoting back into uh, immigration work uh, when I joined Expat Partners initially as an immigration consultant, and then having uh, sworn in as a French lawyer, now I'm in an independent role where I am um, the legal counsel to Expat Partners and help them with their private clients. Um, so thanks to that, I've been able to see Expat Partners approach to it, Jean's approach to it, Carl Wahid, I've been able to develop my own sensibilities. And what I like about working with you, Jean, is that uh, we oftentimes have different approaches for ending, for getting to the same end result. Um, so I think that's uh, what makes us good in working together. Um, yeah, so we've already got about uh, 30 or so participants, so I think it's a perfectly good time to start with our discussion. I thought it'd be helpful to have a bit of an overview, just kind of um, the, you know, 10,000 feet um, visualization of the situation. So, um, obviously, as we know, there is currently uh, closures everywhere. The prefectures are all closed, uh, the consulates are closed, and the borders are closed. In terms of who can actually enter the country, we're looking at those who have 
a legal right to reside in France and their primary residence here in France. So that includes French nationals and their immediate family. Um, that includes EU nationals and their immediate family. And that includes anyone that has a visa or residency permit here in France. Um, the question is also with regards to their primary residence. If a person has their secondary house here in the south of France and they come for two months, uh, there could be grounds upon which the border agent at the French airport says we are going to refuse your entry, which is why um, it's worthwhile to note the uh, all the official publications coming out of the prefectures or France Diplomatie website. They're all saying in this moment, please don't travel because we can't guarantee that you'll get back in. Um, which then begets the question, uh, when will this start to end? Uh, when will we start to return back to a normal system? With the current plan in place with confinement, we know that the phase one of the déconfinement will start on May 11th, next Monday. Um, with that, certain regions of France, according to that carte de déconfinement, the map that has the red uh, and the green département, and currently for the moment, orange departments for those that are in between, um, they will start their effective rollout of the déconfinement in the week that will follow. So with regards to the green zones, which is basically all the south of France and the west of France, um, déconfinement for me looks like they'll be opening up non-essential shops again. Um, it may also include prefectures, which would be good for everyone that needs to um, get their immigration status back in order. Although uh, Jean and I have been able to speak about this previously, neither of us have heard of any prefecture in the country so far that has affirmatively announced that they'll be reopening in May. Um, I was, Jean, I was last night receiving a couple emails from the Barreau de Paris, the French, uh, the Paris Bar. They were announcing that they'd be reopening the Tribunal Administratif and the Tribunal Judiciaire as of next week. So um, I'm not sure what that would look like, but it's interesting to know that parts of the French administration are reopening again. Okay. Uh, in terms of Paris, because I know that most, um, mo a lot of foreigners are based in Paris and a ton of Americans are based in Paris, the déconfinement will come at a later date. Uh, it might take another month or so after May 11th for the rate of uh, contamination and the rate of people being on life support uh, start to go down. And those are the factors that they'll take into consideration to flip a département from red to green. Um, so we might be stuck in a form of uh, this uh, current quarantine until it gets better. That said, as of May 11th, regardless of whether or not we're in a red or green department, my best understanding is that the two things that will go away are the attestation, they will be ended across the country as of May 11th, and the one kilometer limitation will be uh, also ended, expanding to a 100 kilometer limitation. And about beyond that, you can go for um, uh, des motifs impérieux, uh, which is to say, um, it, you know, if it's imperious that you go uh, beyond that 100 kilometer meter um, limitation. I had a client ask me, what does that mean exactly? What is an imperious motive? Like, and uh, from what I've heard from the French administration, they say that it is if you have to do it, if there's no other way than for what you to do. Um, so that's what we're looking at for when things might reopen. Abroad, I think it'll take a lot more time. Um, what we have to consider is how the French administration will start to react. So if they are trying to um, have a country be safe and end the contamination, they're not gonna let folks walk into France if they don't know if that person has the disease. So that could either mean uh, tests upon arrival in France. Um, a lot of countries have speculated about an immunity passport. I haven't seen anyone in France mention that yet. Um, or potentially a vaccine, depending on all the scientists in the world who are racing right now to find that, um, which could be in place, you know, optimistically at the end of 2020, it might take a little bit longer. But until that happens, we'll have to have a, a policy that France puts in place that puts limitations. Um, there was discussion in the new law that had, um, the projet de loi that was just discussed on uh, Tuesday night um, in the Senate, with regards to quarantine, quarantine, and isolement, isolation. So uh, the projet de loi that was just published has given a little bit more clarity on that. Um, basically, the text had said that the quarantine or the isolement would happen at the location of choice of the person in question. It would be applicable to anyone who is entering uh, a 
COVID sensitive zone in the past month. So, I mean, we can assume that's America. Um, it might not be, you know, New Zealand or some of the other countries that are, uh, have made a better progress on the disease. Um, and what that would look like has not yet got, uh, been, you know, explicit enough for me, but that I think would look like um, 14 days of quarantine or isolement. The difference between those two is quarantine is if they suspect that you might have it, isolement is if they have confirmed that you've had it. So they would be uh, either in your domicile, you know, you could choose to be um, in quarantine in your house, or they're supposed to have places that are um, habilité, that are, that are made for these kinds of um, situations. So um, that's good to uh, know. In terms of if there's going to be a limitation on movement, um, then the juge de liberté et de détention uh, can be saisi. So that's the judge, the JLD, that is in charge of um, getting people free. If they're, for example, locked down at Charles de Gaulle, they need to get freed. Um, that would be through the seizing the JLD to get that freedom within 72 hours. You can call on that judge if the limitation on your movement's being enforced, but that would be a maximum of 14 days. Um, let's see, Jean, is there anything that I've mentioned so far that inspires from your response? Just one little thing is that from the experience of one of my recent clients who went from uh, the United States to France, uh, the end, uh, the last email that the consulate uh, sent was basically uh, with just the visa de long séjour, uh, you're not really supposed to be allowed to get in, but if the airline allows you to um, travel, the chances that the French uh, police to let you in are very high. And it mm -hmm. happens that this lady landed in Charles de Gaulle and was allowed to go through it without any problems. So my analysis at this point is, if you have a visa de long séjour that has a name on it, which means visitor or another one, you have a very high chance of being allowed to get inside of France and do not take the consulate's uh, warning because they have a tendency to have to write down basically the worst case scenario. Count on finding the airline that will allow you to travel. The rest of, it, of what you said is perfectly uh, correct. Great, I, I, I'd be disturbed if you disagreed with me. Um, it's all been wrong. And that, that brings up another good point, which is regards to extensions and expirations uh, that I hadn't touched on yet. So um, to be very clear, because there's a bit of ambiguity when the three months got prolonged to six months, but the law as it currently stands is from March 16th through May 15th, the people that have an expiration date within that period have a prolongation of now six months. It used to be three months, it got extended, thank goodness. Um, and Jean and I did not yet have clarity with regards to an extension beyond that. Will that become applicable to the people that have expiration dates occurring in the second half of May, in June, and July? I would really like for the administration to come out and say that, uh, that that will be the case. That has not yet happened. In terms of the legal side of things, what, what would be required for that provision to come into place? So, um, what we had this in the past month and a half is that there was the law that was voted on the 23rd of March that authorized the government, basically authorizing the, you know, the Ministry of the Interior to provide automatic extensions of up to six months for expiration dates happening between that time window, which then a couple of days later, the uh, Ministry of the Interior offered then a three month extension, which was then subsequently followed at the end of April by a six month extension. So they were basically operating within the framework of what the law had authorized them to do. Now, we do not yet currently have any law in the pipeline for which you could then peg this into and say, okay, we're asking for further extensions through May, June, and July. Um, what we've seen so far is the loi de provocation de, les, de la crise sanitaire, the new law that's voted into place that discusses uh, reopening schools and face masks and quarantine and isolement. Um, that law did not yet discuss the titre de séjour. So, Jean, I'd like to turn it back over to you because um, you had mentioned to me a different category, a different way that the government uses sometimes these ordinances to uh, put into place the same proviso. Thank you. Uh, yeah, to make it very simple, is that the French administ uh, administration, to be more precise, the Conseil des Ministres can issue an ordinance that basically would say. Um, 
the uh, the prefecture being closed will be uh, closed up to um, let's say for Paris, Ile de France, up to June first, and therefore the um, carte de séjour that are expiring at that time or the appointments that would be canceled because of that will be covered by this new um, regulation. Uh, mm -hmm. are, I totally agree with you, completely up in the air, but my sense, and it's just my sense, is that they will have to have something that will not be national, but could be uh, per region, mm -hmm. and therefore leaving the préfet, who are basically, if you allow me to say it that way, the governor of the little uh, department, department mm -hmm. to decide exactly how they're going to go within that um, ordinance, organize their prefecture. Uh, we are starting on May, uh, May 15, completely agree with you, up in the air, and we are all waiting for an ordinance to come up and define exactly what's going to happen. And there is no crystal ball here. No, which is unfortunate because I feel like part of our half of our job um, in this field is to be the crystal ball of the French administration. You know, yep. we take a, cli a client's case file, we look at its qualities, and we try to guess if the prefecture or the consulate would accept it. Um, which I think is partially what makes us well qualified to try to guess how the administration will react when it comes to reopening. Um, so, in terms of the prefectures, we'd already touched on this briefly. Depending on the region, I would presume that the reopenings would start. Um, at some time, uh, at least by June, uh, maybe even in the second half of May, um, but we don't know that. We're not sure when that would happen. And if the situation gets grave, if it becomes worse, because, you know, there's the day confinement and all of a sudden it starts to peak again, then there might be a whole confinement and then we might have to keep the prefectures closed. Um, I'm thinking about Paris because we're, you know, Jean and I are in and out of that prefecture every week. Um, what is it? It's a huge line of at least, you know, 200 people outside the front door. And then if, for example, you're on an employee visa, you're going upstairs to the first floor um, in the room uh, 1511, which is packed with 60 people densely sitting in there. Then you enter one by one, you have your fingerprint, you know, you're a meter away from the agent. I can't see any of that being in place uh, in the new normal when it comes, when things reopen. Um, so either that might mean that there is some kind of new system put in place that resembles what France is trying to do for Brexit, like an online platform people can register their documents, which might be a, a source of innovation, which might actually be a good thing coming out of this. Um, or they might have a restricted access. And with the fact that there's, you know, three months, two months of people backlogged, trying to get renewals, uh, extensions, change of status, uh, there's already going to be a huge wave of folks that are going to be wanting to get into the prefecture and if at that point, then we're limiting it to 30% occupancy, uh, I can only see this being disastrous in the short term without a plan. Uh, Daniel, Jean, technical question. May I uh, solicit questions through the chat? Uh, yeah, yeah. People uh, are more than welcome to share their questions within the, within the chat. There are plenty that we can see. So I think we're, uh, I think we're ready to, uh, to take one by one. Sure. Um, so let's touch on the question posed by Karen Kraut. Um, we have an appointment to renew our visa on June 23rd. Can we expect that appointment to take place? Um, yeah, thanks. Good gesture. Jean just summed it up in one word. Um, if the prefectures are open, it would be a fair assumption to assume that yes, that appointment will still occur, that it wouldn't somehow get bumped by someone in the end of March who should have had their appointment in on you know, March 18th, but then it got shifted back. My assumption is that let's, hypothetically, let's say that June 15th, there is a reopening of a lot of prefectures. So the June 16th and June 17th appointments will go on as normal. If you had, for example, I myself am a foreigner from California. I was supposed to pick up my entrepreneur renewal on March 18th. Um, once the prefecture reopens and the people are able to return to their government computers and start working again, that's when I would send them a request for a new appointment. Um, the fact that I already had a standing appointment, uh, you know, has given me legal cover. So if you had a convocation, even though the convocations weren't mentioned in that list of automatic extensions of six months, you know, they listed visas, they listed um, APSs, RCPC, and titre de séjour, they didn't mention convocations, which I, which I thought was actually a flaw in the law, because oftentimes people have their legal status in France, 
they get their appointment after their legal status is expired, but the convocation vaut titre de séjour. The convocation has the same value of having a residency permit. So the, law, the short answer question, uh, answer to your question, Karen, was that if, it, if the prefectures are open on June 23rd, then yes. Um, my best guess is that by June 23rd, it, would, it could be reasonable to assume that the prefectures are reopened, depending on the medical conditions. Okay. Um, one, one, one tiny little thing. Yeah. Just because I am, tend to be a tad more conservative, I'm telling my clients, any appointments that is occurring during the month of May, we go with the assumption that they're going to be uh, canceled. Yeah. Any appointments that are in the month of June, we need to be really ready for them just in case. But at the last minute, we could cancel it because the prefecture is not open. Mm -hmm. um, because I have seen the prefecture being able to turn around and get ready for something very quickly. And I don't want my clients or your clients to be caught off guard and not having a file ready. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I think that's a good idea for folks who are tuning in who need to you know, file for a change of status or get their documents together for renewal. Now yeah. it's the perfect time to get those documents. Now, if we're talking about um, you know, a naturalization and you need to get the apostille of your document, it might be hard to get any kind of official document right now because government services across the globe are basically closed. Um, so I know I've been encouraging my naturalization clients to try to get their documents in order and they've all been stuck. They haven't been able to advance the ball. Mm -hmm. um, there was another question I wanted to check in that was similar to that. Uh, for those who have appointments that have already expired, what's the right process? So you could, in theory, send an email right now to the, uh, you know, the Paris prefecture or the prefecture in, within which you reside, uh, the département requesting a new appointment. My gut, uh, and John, you can feel free to chime in with your experience, is that the prefectural agents are not at their computers right now. Uh, that the information on those computers is so sensitive uh, that they could not necessarily take their computers home with them and work, you know, do home office with a four-year-old running around and your, uh, you know, immigration status, criminal history, dates of entry into France is, you know, on the screen. Um, I've received at least one response from La Direct, French Labor Authority, but I have not received other uh, email responses from the French prefecture. John, what's been your experience with that? Um, as I said, uh, I saw um, the Versailles prefecture answering the client saying, your appointment has been canceled and we will send you an email with the new appointment. So okay. at least for Versailles, we know what they're gonna be doing. Um, for all the other ones in Ile-de-France, basically it's a, a zero response other than just the automatic uh, response that the, um, the, the, the computer uh, issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, right now it's currently 1221. I'm gonna go ahead, Jean, and insert our email addresses into the chat so that yes. people can uh, feel free to reach out to us with follow-up questions. Um, I mean, this is not necessarily an open invitation for us to take our professional services and render ourselves free, but we're happy to um, be of assistance because it's a critical time and we're all in this together. Um, let's see, there was a question. Uh, hey, Chris, can we take a look at that one document um, for the three questions that were emailed in before the meeting? Yes, um, here we go. Uh, Tuck, tuck, tuck. So with regards to a change of status from au pair to student status, um, this is part of a bigger question, which is to say, what should we be expecting for any kind of change of status? Um, there was another question I saw in the chat as well about uh, student enrollment in the fall. I know there's been a big discussion around TAPIF, which is the teaching assistant program in France, which I did and I love back in the day where I taught English for a school year on the French island, La Réunion. Um, and it was my great great way to get into France, um, have gained some quality experience, work on my French, and then figure out a long-term stay in France. Um, in terms of the student status, we don't know what's gonna happen yet. They haven't made any announcements about what the fall will look like. It might look like it's partially online, but they haven't made that announcement yet because it's too far into the future. And TAPIF, similarly, they haven't made any announcement yet as to what that might look like. Um, Jean, it, the quest, second question is easier to address than the first question. Will they begin visit, processing visas by August? Uh, 
my big prediction is that the consults will start reprocessing uh, as of early September. That's pure speculation, uh, but that's my hunch. I know, Jean, you had talked about uh, by fall, which is like September 22nd. That's your best guess. <laughs> yeah, we're saying the, the, just about the same thing. Yeah, so that's how our crystal bars, bars are working. This is a different question, which is interesting, which is to say, if you have a non-renewable status, let's say you're on tape of right now, statue of uh, travailleur temporaire, and you want to change to a status that's longer term, or you're on a different category that does not authorize you to renew in France, could you exceptionally get a renewal in France right now? Um, there's no answer to that question. We don't know how sympathetic the prefecture is going to be in that domain. Um, I know I was fighting for this with a Chinese client who was on a non-renewable uh, one-year temporary status, basically the equivalency of a visitor status in France. Didn't want to go back to China because it was January and the coronavirus was deeply impacted in China right there. So they had got given some appointment to do an um, exceptional extension to their visa. And then that was subsequently replaced by um, the legislation that granted automatic extensions for everyone. So they were on a temporary status in France that got extended. Um, if the US becomes a cesspool of coronavirus um, and it just becomes way too dangerous to return to the US, uh, maybe there's a, you know, exceptional grounds for which the prefecture would authorize you to file for a change of status in France as opposed to flying home for a visa at the US consulate. There's been no indication so far that they would, that the US is gonna become accessible or that this would be the solution. Um, but it's a non-zero chance. That's my thought. What are your thoughts, Jean? Mm, I tend to be a tad more conservative than you. I'm starting by saying, uh, according to law, it's uh, impossible, but the coronavirus uh, crisis has changed absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. and um, I would be daring, just like you do, but just on, with a, a more conservative approach to it. It's mm -hmm. pretty much like, let's pray for miracles, but we might as well shoot for it. Okay. Hey, Chris, can we scroll back up to the top? Uh, there was a second half of question one that I wanted to take a look at. Thank you. Um, oh, Jean, did you want to address the au pair to student question real quick? Mm, no, because uh, <laughs> you said it almost perfectly, so uh, I don't have anything more to say. Okay, and that third question within question one about the primo arrivant, if they're able to do alternance. For those who don't know, alternance is when you are half in a school, half out of school. Um, you can't do it during the first year of your studies in France. And if you leave the country and re-enter, you cannot do alternance right off the bat. Um, okay, let's go then to question. Just oh yeah, one go ahead, more thing because it's a, it's a very good way to understand the process. Every time you ask for a new visa, you have an eraser that takes away absolutely everything you've done before. So think about it. If you go back and ask for a new visa, you lose all the seniorities that you have accrued in France. That is a very important thing to remember. That's all I say. Yeah, that's very valid. Um, question two is about regularization. So basically reading over the text of it. Um, and, uh, and that I can take relatively easily. Um, about regularization, especially this one, it is salarié, which means that two authorities are in charge, préfecture and direct. Préfecture is gonna look almost exclusively on how is the seniority in France being documented. And there is a need for either proof three years or five years. And the way I want it to be is that there is a minimum of one document that is not the payslip that proves the presence in France and every uh, month needs to be proved that way because the prefecture has the capacity to deny submitting the request exclusively on the seniority. That is really where they can uh, check. Now, for a three-year presence, you need to have two years of working in France, at least 20 hours a week systematically, and prefecture will check the hours that is mentioned on the payslip if it goes at least on that minimum. If it is a five-year presence, all there is a need to prove is eight months of work within the last year. And the CESU, which is the payslip that uh, URSAF 
issues works exactly as a payslip and is perfectly acceptable. And what I also need to say, because it is a loophole that people need to understand, is that an undocumented alien, even though this person doesn't have the right to live or work in France, can be registered with CESU, uh, the URSAF in Saint-Étienne will never block that they consider that the employer is in charge of looking at it. And on top of it, with SISU, the registration of the employee can be done on the date and location of birth. It doesn't need to have a French social security number, which means that SISU is the ideal way to regularize someone who, for example, in this case, is a babysitter and or a cleaning lady. And mm -hmm. since the question is July 2015, by July 2020, this person can submit uh, the five-year regularization. Now, the next part is the direct. The direct is going to be looking at the documents that are specifically uh, for the request for the right to work. Normally, direct has a veto right on just about everything that lands on their desk. In this particular um, procedure, they do not have that right anymore. So cleaning ladies and babysitters will be accepted. All there is a need to is to make sure that the formal appearance of the file is properly followed and not much more than that. In other words, the motivation letter, you have to explain that this is a good cleaning lady for you. Um, there is no need for a diploma in cleaning lady, but they need to prove the, uh, the seniority in the job. Thanks to the payslip, it's right there. So that's how I perceive to be the question number two, regularization of a such person. Yeah, uh, yeah, and let's, I guess we'll, um shift back a little bit more towards the coronavirus oriented questions just to chime on at the end of that one though with regards to citizenship um if the person has had an undocumented status in france for a while well i think both of us encourage the person to stay on a legal status for a significant period of time before trying to then immediately file for a naturalization yep uh, uh, the way i say it uh, if you allow me is that in france uh, um, and then is uh, the statute of limitation is three years. So just add quote unquote three years to the normal stay in France so that uh, it is certain that uh, the prefecture is looking at you with that kind of uh, response. Mm -hmm. um, scrolling through some of the uh, conversations, there's been an interesting question, Jean, that uh, I think we both have uh, a perspective to give on with regards to, let's say you're on an entrepreneur status and this year was not a good year. Is the prefecture gonna take into consideration um, the fact that 2020 was a terrible year for everyone? Um, I like to think of France as a country where the employee is king, you know, as compared to America where the client is king. Um, and we've been seeing that with the chômage partiel, you know, that's a regime that's very favorable to French employees who have been basically protected well. I feel like the entrepreneurs we, we've been uh, offered 1,500 euros a month by the government if our revenue is below 70% of what it has been a year ago, which is not that much, uh, relatively speaking, um, depending on how much you, you require to live off of. Um, the, the answer, I think, I mean, that I, I'm happy to respond first, and that you can take it, Jean, is I don't know. I don't know how the prefecture will respond. Um, my assumption having worked with them is that they are humans as well and so there's going to be a certain margin of understanding uh that you know if you've been in france for a couple of years you, you've been a successful entrepreneur and then 2020 happened and your revenue got destroyed because of a net global pandemic um, and then you no longer meet that threshold of being above french minimum wage 18,000 euros of earnings i know jean you tend to set the, the peg higher around 22,000 euros um i don't know how they'd react my gut assumption is that there would be some level of understanding that they wouldn't just, you know, refuse you and give you an OQTF, oblige you to leave France because you're no longer earning what you earned in years prior. Um, at the same time, it's not France's responsibility to, you know, 
keep every unsuccessful entrepreneur. So maybe there's a delicate balancing act. Maybe they reduce the threshold by a certain amount. Um, maybe they give an année blanche. You know, année blanche, they just kind of pardon everyone for the year 2020. I'm not sure if that's how France operates. Um, so I just don't know yet how France will react. Jean, what are your thoughts? Okay. Uh, the way I would approach this is by saying part one is you are below the minimum. So expect a negative answer. How do you counteract that negative answer? First mm -hmm. of all, by showing that you had still a fair amount of work. And the second part would be to show that you have clients waiting for you and that you made during 2020 does not correspond at all to what is going to be your future earnings. Mm. And therefore, I would put the focus on what is for the future and getting letters uh, from uh, the client saying, yeah, I'm uh, using your services again um, to uh, people to reiterate that, uh, yes, they are interested or getting new uh, clients uh, in your portfolio. I strongly advise people not to assume that because COVID was there, that prefecture will renew them automatically. They really have to prove that they have sustainable business and uh, COVID-19 was the reason and the only reason why they couldn't do it this time. Um, let's see, there was one question that I also had found interesting in the um, commentaries. Uh, a person that's requesting about the Passport Talent Salarié Qualifié, which for those who don't know, there's the Talent Passport Regime put in place in November 2016. It was 10 favorable categories for the highly, highly qualified, um, you know, artist, investor, uh, highly skilled worker. Um, the Salarié Qualifié is for those who have finished a French master's degree in the past four years and have a job offer at at least 38,000 euros. Um, and the question is, uh, you know, typically in France, you're, you do two years of work for an employer and then you're a free agent. So that's for talent passport salarié qualifié and for the salarié category. Um, and they said, if what are the rules for changing jobs before the two-year marker has happened? Um, my assumption is that the, the same rules would apply as they do before. If you change your employer, uh, you basically have to go through the whole process again yourself. You have to justify the new employer meets the requirements, but it, it's a it's a uphill battle. Whereas if your employer has had to fire you, put you on show marche or something along those lines, where you can justify that your employer has caused the rupture of the employment, then that would then enable you to say, well, through no fault of my own, I am now back on the labor market and I still qualify with this new employment. Jean, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. There is in France. There is a uh, consideration uh, that you have been uh, dismissed or fired, uh, which is exactly the opposite of the United States. Uh, to be fired is, quote unquote, the good status compared to quitting and getting a better job. Yeah. And the Americans have a hard time uh, grasping that uh, opposition. Uh, so uh, if you're going to go for uh, quitting for a better job, it's absolutely indispensable if you have a passport talent that you uh, have a job that at least qualifies for the initial um, submittance of the, the status. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is that for a normal employee status, it's exactly what you said. It's going back to square one with the risk of the veto at the direct. So it's really uh, something that is dangerous. I remind people that if you quit before the first anniversary, it is basically an automatic refusal, which means that you lose your immigration status at the other end if you don't have anything else. If you are quitting between the first and the second anniversary, the direct will open your file and will review it relatively strictly and sternly, but you have a chance. And as uh, Daniel was saying, between the second and the third anniversary, normally it is that it goes through relatively easily because either the prefecture does not send the file to direct and it's an automatic renewal, 
or if they send it to direct just so that they can have their um, approval, direct at that point is between very and pretty lenient about uh, giving out the right to work. That's okay. where I see it. Thank you, Jean. Chris, can we take a look at question three, please, if we haven't already seen it? So, um, oh, this is so we addressed this at the very start. Maybe didn't everyone didn't hear it um, with regards to what's happening for visas that are expiring, visas being the American, uh, in America, we just talked about everything is a visa, whereas in France, visa is just the sticker in your passport compared to the residency permit, which is um, the card in your wallet. Um, so what's gonna happen for those after May 15th, we do not know yet. Uh, we're hoping for some kind of either law that then grants an ordinance to happen, or as Jean had described it, um, some kind of the equivalency of an executive order where um, the government says we will be processing these people with these expiration dates as if they had an automatic extension, followed by a law that val validates that in the French parliament. Um, question four, please. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, our long stay visas expire on August 27th. Our appointment is on the 23rd. Uh, we talked about this one already. Um, can we expect the appointment to take place? There's a good chance. We don't know if the cancellation was automatic on their side. Um, it does not hurt for you to send an email now, but I'm not sure they would respond. I suggest waiting until the prefecture is reopened and then sending an email to request a rescheduling. Uh, the rescheduling might not be automatic, um, so you may want to be proactive. Uh, in terms of the collection of residency permits compared to the filing for renewals or change of status, I would assume that the collection of residency permit is going to be relatively automatic because they know whose cards they still have and who still need to collect them. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that part is automatic. Um, question five. Uh, can we go to question five because yeah. uh, if I can jump in because a lot Please. of people are completely misunderstanding this, the, the situation. If you are in France, whatever immigration status you have, as long as it's a legal one, it is being extended. If you are not in France, like this person who is in Germany, this person absolutely has to come back to France before the expiration of their uh, immigration status, in this case, May 17. Otherwise, they need to go, the normal process is called a visa de retour. Mm -hmm. This person being in Germany within Schengen, it will not happen because they can go through the border without being checked. So that should be fine, especially if the person is an American. But the law is very clear. Mm -hmm. You are in a foreign country and your immigration uh, status has expired in order for you to re-enter the country legally, you must ask for a visa de retour. I just wanted to say that. The other thing to note is that the date is May 17th. So the current regime in place is only through May 15th. I'm strongly assuming, and I think Jean is too, that between now and May 15th, there will be something, some, some kind of beat on the bone to give an indication of what happens next. Because we might find ourselves in a situation where the prefecture is not reopened as of May 15th, and yet the people have documents that are also expired. Are those people going to be, you know, I don't like to use the word screwed because that's kind of informal. Um, are, they going to, are they going to be in a tough situation? I don't think that it would get to that point. I think the, the prefectures and the French Ministry of the Interior would have enough foresight to see that we need to have a, a provision in place for those people as well. Um, question six, please. Just, just one yeah. thing. I, I was just reading it because it is the dates that are written here. I totally agree with you. The person who has a, a, a deed de séjour expiring on May 17, 99 percent chances that this person is in good shape, especially being in Germany. The risks are zero. Now, someone who thinks that because the card de séjour expires on June 1st and is in New York City is a completely different ball game. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, it's going to be really tricky to enter France right now if you do not have a valid uh, residency permit or visa in your name. If your visa has expired, you'd want to be traveling with your recipice or with your convocation. Um, and I would also travel with a printed up proof of residency in France, the AF bill or whatever, just to really prove to that border agent that by all intents and purposes, your primary residence is here in France. Correct. Um, tech to tech, question six. 
I want to visit uh, the U.S. Um, we have a carte de séjour. Um, what are the U.S. states planning for those arriving from France? Uh, that's more of a U.S. question than a France question. I know we've seen a couple other questions in the chat about, I'm French, can I go to other EU countries? Um, and the law that would be applicable would be those countries. So that would be a matter of understanding what the U.S. policy is, uh, which is basically trying to limit as much. I know for the U.S. side of things, we're trying to limit as much as possible, but I don't know offhand the exact 100% policy for the U.S. Um, I don't know if Jean would give a, a finer eye on what the U.S. is doing. Um, I, I just know that general, generally speaking, I, I would not travel to the U.S. right now because um, I would not be able to guarantee the person could get in, uh, nor would I encourage people in the U.S. to travel to France right now because we're in one of the strictest lockdowns in the country, in the world. Um, okay, do we have information regarding students' visas? Okay, so this is one of the questions I had uh, addressed earlier. Uh, we don't have visibility yet. It might look like online classes that shift into in-person classes. Um, we do not know yet. Um, but I wouldn't hesitate to at least plan for that possibility. I know that people, um, for example, if you want to have your best long-term stay in France, maximize your chances in France, I always tell people to get a master's in France. Because once you get a master's, then you have Frenchified yourself education-wise, you've learned the lingo if it's in French, you're allowed to then file for that 12-month postgraduate um, Titre de séjour, the RECE, the Recherche d'Emploi et Création d'Entreprise, used to be called APS. That lets you find a job in your sector and then stay. If the salary is above 27,000, you can just take the job and then remain in France indefinitely at that point. Um, those plans are getting interrupted if the master's programs aren't letting in new students or foreign students. Um, at this point, we don't have enough visibility, so it wouldn't be hurt to plan as if those schools are going to reopen, you know, apply to get in start creating your profile on Campus, Campus France, and then we'll see as the situation evolves. Um, question eight, I was awaiting the convocation to pick up my card, never received the email or text. Uh, will the prefecture be automatic in issuing that? Uh, let's do both. Um, it may in fact be automatic. It does not hurt to send an email to the generic uh, email address of your prefecture requesting an appointment. Uh, including photocopies, uh, attachments of your passport uh, and your most recent uh, immigration status in France. Um, question eight, uh, any ideas on how student and APS, um, tech, 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 sorry, uh, will be operated? Uh, I know a lot of unis are opening September, tech, tech, graduate in July, my status does not expire until December. You're planning to switch from APS to a free job. So as I mentioned, the APS um, used to be called Autorisation Provisoire de Séjour. Um, it was basically just a slip of paper. Um, I remember I was so frustrated when I had my student status, which was an actual card. They took it, cut it in half, and handed me a piece of paper. APS told me to keep that in my pocket for a year. Um, thank goodness now the APS has been replaced by the RECE, which is another residency permit. Um, so, in terms of uh, being, in terms of the question in it, um, what will it look like? Um, it's tricky here because uh, Jean, you know, is very clear about this when it comes to people that are on student status. You want to be, be careful to respect the norms of what your student status authorizes you to do. It authorizes you to work 964 hours in a 12-month period. It does not necessarily authorize you to form your own company, your own micro enterprise. Um, and if you start to do that, you could always be exposing yourself to the risk that you're trying to have more than one status at, at the time, uh, which the French prefecture doesn't always know about. So sometimes you skate by, but it's not conformed to what the law state. Um, so if you cannot file for your APS because you're stuck on student status, that's gonna have real implications, I think, um, for people that want to, once they get their APS, you know, R-E-C-E, R-E-C-E, means that they can start to create their own microenterprise during that 12 month window. Uh, you can the 964 hour limitation is just waived. So you can start working with that limitations. If you're on a, stuck on a student status, you cannot pivot. So, um, and unfortunately those rights are not granted until you go to the prefecture and get those, those documents. So we don't yet have clarity as to how the prefecture will react to that. Jean? Yeah, one little thing that people need to understand is that main d'oeuvre étrangère, which is the little office within direct, basically they need to be considered as Cops. The office next door is uh, l'inspection du travail. Mm -hmm. The main d'oeuvre étrangère employee has a computer that have pretty much direct access to 
euh, URSAF, Pôle emploi, euh, Info et euh, Caisse primaire d'assurance maladie, which means that they can know just about right away if you have exceeded it in the number of hours you have worked. And mm -hmm. that is a very valid reason for them to deny the request. Mm -hmm. That is extremely important for people to understand. Also for the, um, the having an, a, a student status and being auto-entrepreneur at the same time. Just think for it for a second. You're absolutely right that at the beginning of that um, business, the prefecture can ignore it completely because it doesn't show right away on what the students is giving. But if the student has had that business for over a year, 99% sure that the prefecture is going to ask for an avis d'imposition. Mm. And on the avis d'imposition, there will be the mention of B and C. It's up for the prefecture to deny the request and issue an OQTF or let it go. Mm -hmm. We have seen about half and half uh, in terms of uh, the chances of success. Would you yeah, agree? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, per, per usual genre, I agree with you. Um, can we scroll down, please, uh, Chris? So, uh, how about that? The, the question right about that. Yeah, the, the two thirds part. Um, so, carte bleue européenne. So, if you're, so I'm assuming by carte bleue, you mean the carte bleue européenne, the um, talent passport, highly qualified worker category. Um, so, we might have more clarity, but uh, DC juillet, before July, we might know, in fact, what will happen for documents that are expiring in July. That's what I'm hoping. Um, it, if we don't have any clarity, if the government is lagging, that it's May 16th, May 17th, we still don't have any information about what happens to people with expiration dates. Uh, it's hard to say what would happen, but it's not been your fault. You've acted in good faith, and it is the government's, it is the government at fault for not giving enough clarity. So, um, you know, you'd put on your lawyer hat and argue that, you know, you've been wronged by the government and that you deserve to have a card. You know, play, that's how I would play if I had to email the prefecture saying, you know, it's po post this date and I still don't have any information about my expired status. Um, let's see. Jean, did you have any reactions? Jean, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so question nine. My question, April, uh, sorry, appointment for um, my first entrepreneurial renewal uh, was planned for mid-April. The visa expired in January. You're in position of a SPC. Is it your responsibility to schedule a new appointment or you can expect them? I would think that the ball is actually going to be in your court um, when it comes to getting the appointment for the actual delivering of your case file. Um, so I would definitely, you know, stay on that, follow the news. It doesn't hurt for you to actually follow what your prefecture says. So if you were to go online and assuming that you're in Paris, you type, you know, Prefecture de Police de Paris, and then that would pop up. You'd be able to see on their main page what it says for the coronavirus updates. You click on the tab that either says Consortisson étranger or another one uh, further down that also mentions étranger. And those are two good resources to see what is the newest and most breaking information for uh, foreigners and their rights in France. Um, question 10. I have a question regarding 90-day renewal. My card is expiring on May, in May, and I read that the government is granting 90-day extensions. Oh, okay. So you're talking about the tourist stay here in France. Um, mm -hmm. are, you, are you reading it differently? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So maybe that's actually, they think that there's the three-month extension that I got, that I got extended to six-month extensions. Yep, that's fine. Um, thank you, Jean. So what is the proper way to go about... I renew my student visa. Okay, I was just scanning it, so I didn't see that. Okay, yeah, the last few words. Um, yes, so if it was expiring before May 15th, then we're now up to six months, which is good. And then we'll wait for the government to react so we know what kind of rights that we have. Um, it's worthwhile to mention that there is a provision in place for those on a tourist stay. Let's say you're an American, you flew in here, and you're close to the end of your 90-day stay in the Schengen area. You can, in fact, contact the prefecture um, there's information about that on the prefecture's websites. Basically, you have to state why you cannot return to your home country with some kind of proof, photocopy of your passport, photocopy of your entry stamp, and some kind of proof of residency in France. Proof of residency being electricity bill, gas bill. You know, at some point you're here now in France, so you have to have some kind of proof of residency. Um, 
I had contacted them for an individual who had already passed the 90-day threshold asking for this kind of extension, and they refused it, saying this person had already exceeded the 90 days, and so they were not subtle, um, souple, I'm losing my English, uh, flexible on that point. Um, tuck, tuck, tuck. So we, we have addressed question 11 already, so, uh, and then question um, 12 was, was, we had addressed this earlier with regards to can a French person travel to Germany, that would be two things to keep in mind, crossing into Germany, what is German's current rules about uh, quarantining, um, if I'm not mistaken, my, my fiance is German, uh, that if you have entered France and are coming into Germany, then you have to self-quarantine for two-week period in Germany. Um, and that's likely also gonna be the case vice versa. If you enter you know, from Germany into France, you would have to do that because that's the norm. Everyone here is in self-quarantine. But you would have to research that more on the German side. What is German's current immigration rules? Sean? No, 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 I'm, I'm reading 13. Okay. Uh, no, you're fine. Great. I'm currently paxed and have been in France for six years. I now live apart from my partner and want to apply for the 10-year card. Okay. Um, the rule says I need to have a marriage certificate if I'm married. Does that apply for those who are paxed? And if so, can I supply a certificate without supporting other documents, film the same name? So um, my gut reaction is to ask the question, what is your current immigration status? Is it based off of your relationship or not? Um, if you are currently here on a worker status, um, then you might have to demonstrate information with regards to your PACs, uh, but you would not have to justify that the PACs is still live and active for you to qualify for them for the 10-year card. Whereas if you got PACs and then switched over to a VPF, vie privée et familiale, uh, due to the PACs, but that are now living separately, um, you need to inform the prefecture that you no longer qualify for this category and try to fit yourself into another category. Correct. It, which means that it goes without saying, but I absolutely want to say it. You cannot ask for the carte de résident in the latter uh, scenario that uh, Daniel was um, presenting, because you will be changing from vie privée familiale, what is called VPF, to another status, probably linked to work. And there will be that change that the prefecture imposes on you, you cannot go directly to a carte de résident if your family status has changed and forces the immigration status to change. Mm -hmm. um, carte de résident, I don't see too often because oftentimes when people reach that five-year marker, they just want to file for naturalization. Mm -hmm. um, but from what I've seen, um, and Johnny may have had more experience on this, they only like to accept carte de résident applications within the context of a renewal, not within the context of a change of status. So if you've been in France... You're absolutely right. Okay, great. Totally, totally I, love, right. I love when Jean says I'm right. That's how I know that I'm actually right. Um, if you are going from... I had an individual who tried to do this, going from passport talent, European blue card, to a visitor status because he had stopped working for his employer two years ago but never told the prefecture, and within that change of status was trying to file for the 10-year card, we hit a brick wall and they told us, no, you have to file for the change of status to visitor. And then if at the end of that sixth year, he qualifies for the carte de résident um, because he's you know, proof of residency in France, proof of paying the taxes in France, then uh, the question could start to be dis discussed. Um, Just a little more thing is that people have to understand that in order to issue a carte de résident, the prefecture has to be convinced that your anchor is so strong in France that you have obtained de facto a permanent right to stay in France. And the mm -hmm. carte de résident is just there to document something that already exists, at least in the way they perceive your status. So mm -hmm. if you're gonna be changing your status by definition, you put a risk on your anchorage and therefore is incompatible with the carte de résident issuance. Question 14, uh, I might need a little bit more information about it. Uh, they are asking if their recipe is expired. It depends on when their recipe is expired. If expired between that time window of March 16th through May 15th, you're covered. If that happened before, you might find yourself in hot water because you would have needed to have reacted before the date of expiration. Um, it mentions renewing the passport talent by mail. So the Paris prefecture at least, the only way to get an appointment is filing by mail, and they're generally reactive. Um, but you cannot do the entire process by email. Of course, you have to go into the prefecture at least 
twice, once to file and the second time to collect the card. Um, of course, they're not responding right now. Um, in my gut assumptions, because the information on the computers are so sensitive, they're not letting the majority of their employees go home and that maybe they've got a couple people stuck up in the prefecture just doing like emergency email response, you know, flagging to everyone that things are delayed, we'll get back to you. Uh, but that in terms of the functional, functional substantive treating of applications, that's not happening right now. Um, question 15, apologies have been covered. Uh, does the extension of the expiring visa still apply if one is in the process of switching from one category to another, uh, going from a student uh, visa to VPF? So I'm not, I'm, there's a couple of different concepts there. For example, I had a convocation in April, which didn't happen. Uh, I believe my student status is renewable. Um, and it's considered automatically renewed because of the April expiration, yes. But I graduate this month and will thus no longer be a student. So as I understand it, the current status that you have is preserved. So the rights within that status are preserved and prolonged until you are able to successfully change to the VPF. VPF, its advantage as the VPF familial is that it offers you to work or not work in whatever capacity you like. Um, you know, it could be employee or independent. Uh, until then, you're still on a student status, which will still be considered valid, um, but it wouldn't have any extra benefits. Any thoughts, Sean? Mm, nope, you said okay. perfectly. Thank you. Um, and Chris, thank you so much for the technical help. I really appreciate it. Um, hi, and thanks. I mentioned it. I'm an American with my marriage visa uh, in November. Um, I got my German citizenship back, congratulations. Um, You've got, you're now German status. You have to decide if you're treated as American or German. Definitely go with the German route because you're European and a residency permit in France is facultative. So you don't have to continue with your immigration status so long as you have proof of your German nationality. Um, yes, this, uh, this is definitely what I would do in your case. Uh, you're, if you have proof of your German citizenship, like a passport or a German national identity card, um, you can say, you can kiss the prefecture goodbye and move on and live a better, happier life. Um, yes, yeah, Okay, just so mm -hmm. that people understand, EU country is a country in the United States for that specific topic. In other words, a German citizen has just as much right to live in France as a French citizen. And I often make the comparison that someone who's got a New York uh, driver's license who uh, moves to California will change the driver's license to prove that there is a new residency in California, okay? Well, Fran I mean, the EU is not completely federal. We still have states that are independent states for a good portion of it. But when it comes to citizenship, it works exactly like the United States for that particular point. I think what's been surprising within the EU was that the internal borders have been, the barricades on the borders have been put into place, which has never happened in the history of the EU, that uh, they're blocking entry to EU, EU nationals between the countries due to the coronavirus. Um, that's what particularly surprised my fiance, Lisa, who's German, who's particularly pro-European, um, uh, that she's just never seen that. It would be almost as unthinkable to us as Americans if there was a border between California and Arizona that was enforced, that you could not drive into Arizona. Like, as an American, that would be quite mind-blowing. So, um, let's see, so we've addressed question 16. Let's turn to question 17. Um, you're trying to get a visa extension. Uh, so you're on a CDD, a temporary term contract. Um, I will apply for teacher permission this summer through the dance. I'm not sure if I fully understand what the question is. I don't know if Sean has a better reading of it than I do. How to get a visa extension. Uh, I think we would need to have more information on this one. Um, so you could feel free to shoot an email to me or Jean. Our email addresses were stuck halfway up there. I'm gonna just copy and paste them again. Um, here you go. My, um, my only small comment is that if this person gets a job, as the Centre National de Danse in Paris, it is such a high level uh, uh, organization or a school that my guess would be this person is fine as long as the person can prove that they are uh, enrolled with that school. That's all. 
Yeah, there's an extra level of complication when you're an artist in France um, because the rules are different. Uh, how you earn money in France is, tr is complicated. So like, let's say that you're trying to get into France on the talent passport artist category. There's two ways of being an artist in France. You can be an artist as an employee, like one of my clients who um, is an artist for Pixar. He's, uh, you know, has a contract with Pixar. Or you can be an artist in the sense that you've got your own independent art portfolio as if you're an independent. Then there's the question of, are you an intermittent spectacle? There's a lot of different levels to it. Um, so I would definitely want to go through that case in, in, you know, in detail to make sure that mm -hmm. you've got an artist status that makes sense. Also, there's a different type of category for um, employment contracts. There's CDD and CDI, as we all know, but then there's uh, CDDU or something along those lines. Well, it gets complicated when you're an artist. Uh, quarantine measures, we addressed this earlier. Uh, it applies to the country that you're going into. You definitely want to look into that for the specific country that you're entering, uh, including the US. In retrospect, maybe I should prepare that question more, but I didn't think that was going to be a question that would be raised. Um, we mentioned the status travailleur temporaire, which as a word of warning is a big catch-all category. I call it like a kitchen, a kitchen sink category because that includes people that are working on a CDD, temporary term contract, people that are seconded to France to doing an international service provider, and those that are on a short-term contract that are non-renewable, like if you're working in, in tape of doing language instruction. So uh, I would almost be curious to read the actual visa or titre de séjour and see what kind of travailleur temporaire you are. Um, set to expire in July, the employer wants to renew my status. Since I already have a carte de séjour, am I going to be able to renew at the prefecture or go back to the States? Um, I have an appointment at the prefecture on the 17th. Um, I had raised this question with my colleague earlier this week. Um, the key thing is to read the text on the card itself and see what kind of work authorization you have. Um, I think that would actually be the sign to know if you're able to run file for renewal in France or not. Jean, what are your thoughts? Same thing. I'm saying the same thing as you do. Okay. Um, just because you get an appointment at the prefecture doesn't mean that the prefecture will agree that it is, you know, uh, authorized to process the application, unfortunately. Um, I'm getting extra words here. Okay. This is another uh, complication. Um, if you are given a CDE by your employer, that your employer does not necessarily have a masterful understanding of French immigration law. Um, I don't even know if I know any human resources um, in France that are not deadly afraid of French immigration law because they don't quite get it because um, it's a bit spooky to figure out how to respect it. So they, a company might be giving out a CDE even if, even if you might not be able to qualify for it. So um, those are just my two cents. Sean? Um, I'm fine. I'm looking at the question 20 and that is um, a very important one. Okay. Let's take a look at it. I was in the process of changing my status from étudiant to salarié. It's given a recipe that expires at the end of May. We don't have it yet, the extension. Uh, my application was uh, denied by the French Labor Authority uh, because my employee did not employ all the information. Since losing this job, I've been offered another job, often um, also a CDE with a company willing to help. Is this possible? Can I go to the prefecture before my recipe expires to ask for extension? John, do you want to take this question right off the bat? Yes. The reason <laughs> is that what people have to understand, the way I present is that if you submit a request for a change of status to salarié going through direct, normally it's a one shoot, it goes all the way up to, if the direct gave a negative answer, you get the occupier, which is the, uh, the, um, the obligation to leave the country. Yeah. The reality is that there is some time, some delay between the time the direct sends you the negative answer and the issuance of the OQTF. And there is there a window that absolutely, if you are in that situation, you should use to the best of your ability, especially if you have a new employer, get that new employer to make the perfect file, to make it as great, as powerful as possible, so that when the prefecture gets this new file, you have to understand that if you ask the question to the prefecture, the prefecture has the legal obligation to answer you, which means that this new submittance 
automatically blocks the issuance of the OQTF and forces the prefecture to send it back to direct and you keep yourself legal in France. Great, that was a great answer. Um, uh, I would agree with you, Jean, that uh, it generally speaking is a one, one shot uh, with the direct. So once you get that refusal, it becomes much, much more complicated. It requires, you know, the basically the prefecture participating with you trying to get a new application going. And, you know, we, you know, Jean and I have a hard time getting the prefecture to do anything we want, much less the person that only deals with the prefecture from time to time. So definitely an uphill battle at that point. Um, question 21, hoping you will have time for questions about flying in and out of the US um, and France and around EU under the reopening rules popping up. Apologies, you already dealt with that. Um, so flying into France, we'll address that real quickly. You must have your primary residence here in France and you must have uh, the right to reside in France. Visa, titre de séjour, recipicé. If you're a French or EU national or then you get family or children, you're allowed to come in um, into France. And then with the other locations, the US or the EU, um, there's you know, similar rules that are in place, but it will vary country by country. Um, I know that Jeanette had a client who had a visa who was able to enter the country, which is an interesting question. If you have not yet established your primary residence in France, but plan on doing it, will they let you in? And I think in that case, and that, that proves that at least with one border patrol agent, the answer is yes, that you are making that furtive step to, be, to establish your primary residence here in France. If you already have the housing lined up, then, um, then that's where you live now. So, um, question 22, just follow up on this passport talent question. If you do get fired and find a new job for two years, you're not allowed to just go ahead and change. Oui, mais je parle pas le long terme, je parle quand je sois, quand je la 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 télé. Hold on a second, everyone's muted right now. Let me find Daniel and Jean, and the floor Thank is yours. Thank you. Um, if you are in fact fired, then you do have the legal right to. Um, go back on the job market. What you'd want to do then is prove that the document has been submitted by that employer to the Pôle emploi um, that has, you know, that you are now uh, back on the, on the job market and that you've got uh, some kind of proof of the end of your employment with that employer. Um, Jean, do you have thoughts? Yes, uh, pretty much just like what I was explaining about um, direct main d'oeuvre étrangère, now, at least for the Paris prefecture, they also have the system so that if, for example, you change employers or you have uh, registered with Pôle emploi, they get some kind of a signal, which they either act upon it or they don't. So sometimes uh, people who change jobs are being asked uh, by the prefecture, please come in and give us the new um, contract with the, uh, the most recent pay slips. Uh, and when you are unemployed, they want to see the documents. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are going to be denying you the um, prolonging uh, the existing four year card that you have. It's just that they want to check you in because they have the information. Some other prefecture, for example, like Marseille or some others, demand that the uh, foreigner uh, informs the prefecture. So uh, it really depends from prefecture to prefecture, but always keep in mind that if you lose your job or if you change jobs, prefecture either will know or wants to know. It doesn't mean that you lose your card. It simply means that they are, on, you are under surveillance, that's all. Yeah, I think uh, question 23 is quite interesting. Will they be mailing out the titre de séjour uh, no. when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to it? So I know that in certain rural prefectures, they do have a kind of policy in place where that, that can happen. Um, that hasn't happened yet. And in terms of innovation, I would love for France to innovate in a certain sense, almost like a, um, like a food distributor where you, you know, you put in a couple of quarters and you get a bag of, not, of um, you know, Fritos. There's no reason, I think, from a technological standpoint, why we couldn't have some kind of facial scan, fingerprinting, and then you're able to receive your own residency permit. They have nothing of the kind like that in France right now. Um, if France were smart, it would start to explore these kinds of automations that could happen. 
I would love for that to be a reality. The risks of fraud, I think, is why France has not gone that route so far. So if you say you wanted to get to this address and then it never got to you, or it did, but you you know gave it off to your your buddy who doesn't have status, um, you know at least there's accountability when you have to go to the prefecture, you have to get fingerprinted, and then you receive your card in front of the agent. They know that the person who was supposed to get it did in fact get it. Um, I think that's why France has a such a regulated way of giving out residency permits. Um, Just a little thing for the um, uh, what you are talking about the rural areas. Uh, I got uh, someone who was in France many 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 years ago. Uh, and was explaining that she would go to the little mairie because the prefecture would send the carte de séjour from the prefecture to the mairie where she lives. And she was saying basically that um, it felt like since uh, there were maybe a uh, hundred people in the city in the, uh, and the mayor, knew everybody. So it felt more like going and see a pal than the official uh, going to a prefecture and being among another 300 people uh, waiting in line. But um, as far as I, uh, as I know, you have to get your carte de séjour from a French authority, which means either a mayor or the prefecture or someone like that or the police station. Mm -hmm. Um, just real quick, seeing in, in the chats, there's a, uh, another kind of reopening of the question about the automatic extensions. Um, so just to reiterate that for those who haven't heard this part, yes, the uh, extensions are automatic. No, there are not any steps that you have to take in order to guarantee your automatic extension if the, if the expiration happened between March 16th and May 15th. Uh, and it was 90 days, now it's 180 days of an extension. Um, 24, uh, this question is to say, if I'm on chômage partiel due to this uh, situation, will I lose my immigration status? To the best of my understanding, no. Uh, you maintain your immigration status. It was not through your fault. And it's important to note that in France, employee is king. You are still technically employed. The link of employment between you and your employer has not been broken because you're placed on chômage partiel. Um, compared to this to America, where the link is broken, um, and that's why we have an employment rate of around 22% uh, right now. We'll see the official statistics uh, Friday morning at 8.30 East Coast time for the US unemployment rate. In France, they've kept it down because they have the institution of Chômage Partiel. Um, question 25, and Chris, can you real quick just tell us how many questions are on this late? 28? Okay. 28. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess we can start uh, planning to wrap it down in the next 15 minutes. Um, how can people with residence permit in other EU countries and want to register here in the prefecture, what should they do? Uh, do people, do they need to? Is it unnecessary? So the short answer is that it is facultative. You don't need to register your presence in France um, if you're German or Swedish or uh, you know Dutch, you don't need to go to the prefecture. I would discourage you from doing that because it's a real pain. Um, the only people to keep in mind uh, that will need to have this on their, on their horizon is the British nationals. Um, I'm not sure if there's any that are tuning into this particular chat, but um, the grace period for Brexit expires on December 31st. So currently British nationals are still treated like they are EU. They can come to France, um, they can start working immediately. As of July, there's supposed to be an online portal that's made active where the British nationals can start to register their presence. Um, that portal will stay active for 12 months. During that 12 month window, you'll have to register your presence. Jean? My little thing is that when I read that, it is also possible that someone like an American lives in Holland mm -hmm. and wants to come and live in France. Yeah. There, it is the whole process of immigration that needs to be done because for non-EU citizens, each country is an independent country. And it's not because you have residency in uh, Holland that you would be obtaining a residency in France. The only exception to that is, as you know, la carte bleue européenne, because it gives an employee right to work at the EU level. Mm -hmm. um, just to add on to that, so I know that with regards to the carte de résident, which is the 10-year card in France, you establish permanent residency in France, and that authorizes you to go to other EU countries 
in which you would have to simply request that you fit into a different category. So like if you were trying to move to Italy from France, having a, the 10 year card, you could then qualify for the equivalency of like the visitor status, if that's what you wanted, or the student status without Italy being able to préalablement oppose your entry into the country, um, which is slightly different from the uh, European blue card question, um, but concurrent. Yeah. Uh, and thank you as well to all, the, all those in the comments who are thanking us. We're very appreciative for all of your, under, of your um, participation. Uh, question 26. I've been living in France with a long stay visa for two years. Uh, okay, I'm assuming that's visitor when, that, when they just say long stay visa. Uh, occasional visits to the US. Been in confinement here since March. Lease ends May 15th. I would like to go to Brittany where I normally spend the summer. Uh, my husband arrived in France in early March for a visit. I'm severely immune compromised and it is dangerous for my doctor for me to be fly back to the US. What do I need to do to stay in France? Um, and what about my husband's 90 day tourist stay? Great question. So let's do uh, in, in turn. You're on a visitor status. Um, you would be filing for a renewal in the months preceding the ex uh, expiration of your status. Um, your lease is a separate question, so I'll deal with that in a second. Um, what you need to do in terms of your stealth is make sure that once prefecture is open that you file again for renewal. If your status expired, you would then um, get the automatic extension. Otherwise, you would file for a new appointment and continue your legal stay. In terms of your husband, you would do what you um, should have him do in the days preceding the 90-day expiration. You would contact the prefecture where you live and you would say, my husband is here due to the fact that I'm immunocompromised. He's you know, here with me, taking care of me and making sure that we're all well. He can't fly back, I need him. Um, so then you would contact the prefecture via their email uh, with photocopy of passport, photocopy of entry stamp, um, proof of residency, which in your case would be you making a, a housing attestation in your name towards him and a proof of residency in your name and a photocopy of your residency permit. Um, in terms of going to Brittany, um, currently what we have in place is the confinement phase one starts May 11th, that authorizes you to go up to 100 uh, kilometers. Um, so if you're in Paris trying to get to Brittany, that's too far for the, in the immediate period. Maybe in the second phase, that's June 2nd, they authorize larger trips, in which case you could justify going to Bretagne. Um, so that's the question of lease. You might either have to have a um, prolongation of your lease. You can try to negotiate that with your landlord or um, have your lease end and make a move to a new location in Brittany. Um, question 27, uh, last follow up on the expiring e APS. Um, if there is no automatic extension for people post May 15th, am I allowed to continue working? Uh, while there is no clarity on that, the assumption is yes, that you are able to continue the legal rights that you've currently had. And the fact that the pandemic stopped the processing from the government doesn't mean that your rights have stopped. Um, one second. There's, okay, there's two actually, that's not a problem. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't hesitate to have you keep on working. Um, uh, and a quick question, I may have missed an early answer. Will the prefecture stick to a schedule for a June 10th convocation? Uh, if the, if the prefecture is open before June 10th, then I would have you walk in on that June 10th appointment with your case file, with your passport, and with your visa or residency permit. Um, if, if it's not delayed, if it's not open that day, then, then you would want to file for rescheduling by email or by phone. The number that you want to call if you're in the Paris region is 3430. If it's for a talent passport, you want to give them an email. Um, information on how to file extension. Uh, there's not necessarily, uh, it's automatic, so you don't have to file for it. Yeah, this is the question I saw earlier in the chat. That's good. Uh, question 30. So follow up to question, okay, so that was that was a question about filing for after the direct is refused um, uh, and a job application. As long as I go to the prefecture ASAP, is it possible I could get a new convocation and won't have to leave by May 26? Well, it's not possible at all to go to the prefecture right now as it's closed, and I cannot see the prefectures within the Paris region opening anytime soon. Um, so it may be hard to get the prefecture to make any furtive motions. Jean, did you have any thoughts on that? True, but the thing is that uh, considering everything, uh, the person had the recipe that is uh, expiring on May 26, the prefecture is closed on that day. Let's say that it opens on uh, June 20th. She sh uh, this person shows up on June 20th, 20th with the new file. 
Um, and uh, at least at the desk, I think they would send them to 1511. And at 1511, which is a room on the first floor. Yeah, if they follow the regulation that we have been talking from the beginning, they have to acknowledge the fact that the recipice is still valid because it was extended and therefore they need to take the file. Uh, if they refuse to take the file, then they need to give them an appointment. Great. That's um, the way I would go. But then it's the decision of the chef de service. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take a look at some of my uh, pre-discussion notes to talk about anything that might be of interest. Um, there was a couple of questions that people asked about naturalization, which I think would be worthwhile just to address in a very superficial manner. Um, I had a couple of people emailing me asking me if they can just naturalize to avoid this whole immigration issue. And I want to make sure that everyone knows that naturalization is never a quick process, it's never an easy process, regardless of the category of it. So there's two main routes. I mean. For adults, there's two main routes. There's by marriage or by presence in France. By marriage, it's you know four years from being married in France, living in France, or five years if you're living abroad. If you're trying to have the presence in France route, it's five years presence in France, reduced to two years presence if you've done two years of higher studies in France. On, on, the, on the presence side of things, you also want to have um, uh, professional insertion, so proof that you've been on the French labor market. The general standard is 18 months. Although I know of a lot of students that have completed their two years master's without a CDE and then filed for naturalization and they've been in a good place. Um, but putting together the document is not easy. And then filing takes, you know, about 18 months for them to process. If you're in the South, it takes years. It actually takes actual years for them to figure out how to process the application. Paris, they're much more sympathetic. Um, for those that are in Paris that are thinking about moving to the suburbs, just keep in mind that all of the suburbs around Paris are terrible. Um, and when it comes to processing uh, naturalization claims, you can only do it by getting an appointment. And you can't get an appointment unless you go online and try to request one, and there's almost never appointments available. So, um, for example, Nanterre, if you file, uh, if you go online at between 9 to 10 p.m. in the morning to try to get an appointment, you have to try that every, every day of the week, every morning, you know, until you finally are able to book that appointment. So naturalization is never easy, but it is the way to win the game. Once you've become French, you no longer have to deal with the prefecture. You can um, live your best life, move away from France, move back to France, et cetera. Jean. One little thing is that the way I presented is that in the United States, at least in the old days, you would pledge allegiance to the United States and the flag and so on. The French system is that not only do you pledge, but you have to prove your complete allegiance, which means that you need to prove that every facet of your life has the primary center in France. And a lot of people do not understand that. And for example, they say, oh yeah, um, my, uh, my dad died and I have substantial trust and I have a large amount of money in there and they have a decent job, but not too big. And the prefecture will say, you cannot be French because the majority of your income comes from a foreign source and uh, your uh, salary is fine, is nice, but you should have had your money being invested in France uh, if you've got that much. And I recently had a case like this that we had to um, fight against. Uh, or uh, you, uh, in the process, when uh, after the appointment and you're waiting, uh, you end up uh, marrying someone, uh, which was also a case I, I had a few years ago, and the person is getting the visa in, for example, Texas, the process will be suspended as long as your new spouse doesn't have a titre de séjour in France. So you really need to think, I need to prove my allegiance. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, so the center of your family and your economic interests have to be in France. So you can't have a job in the UK, a spouse in India and a daughter in Mexico. It all, you know, it all has to be right here. If your, adult is, if your daughter's an adult, you can have an adult daughter wherever mm -hmm. she wants to go. Um, and I had a really tricky case of a client who was very French, you know, from Mexico, had done French lycée in high school, and everything was very French. Her, hus her husband was very French as well, had studied here. He was taking a two-year job in London, 
and then was in London when she filed for it. And he's planning on coming back and we made it very clear in the file and it was refused because her husband was temporarily not residing in France. So the Center for Economic Interest and Family Interest was not located in France. So, okay. um, so yeah, those are objects to keep in mind. I think if I may say so that we're at the end of the, um, the presentation, the webinar, um, Barring no other comments, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We really appreciated all of your participation. Thank you so much, Jean, for your lovely uh, feedback. You've done a wonderful job, uh, and we are on the same wavelength, so that was and impeccable. Thank you very, very much to organize all this with Chris. You yes, are really you, the tractor for the, putting this together, and uh, I thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of that thing with you. Yes. And yes, thank you, Chris, as well, for your uh, technical help. It's been really fluid, and I haven't had to do anything else other than focus on the substance. So thank you so much. Um, uh, everyone take care. Bon confinement, as they say. Um, and uh, we'll take find out. To, <laughs> yeah, and we'll uh, be tuning in at 4 o'clock. That's when um, Edouard Philippe is supposed to be announcing uh, greater measures about the day confinement starting as of May 11th. So that's at 4 p.m. today. Let's put that on your radar. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. Cheers. Have a great day, everybody. Okay. Take care. Bye.